Let's get started. Hello everyone, and welcome to the EdgeMaker Digital Air Series product launch and live demo. My name is Cecily Carter, and I am the Director of Marketing here at Fizzle. I will be serving as your host and your moderator today. On behalf of the entire team at Fizzle, I want to thank you for joining us. We are doing something really important, and we are very excited to share it with you today. Last week, we launched the EdgeMaker Digital Air Series. Our first of its kind solution is the only on the market that can remotely operate multi-vendor particle counters in scientific data applications. Scientific data is the future of IoT automation. So today we will learn all about it. We will discuss why scientific data is the new frontier for the internet, starting with particle counters. We will discuss what customer problems we solve, but most importantly, we will show you how the EdgeMaker Digital Air Series solves the problem of remotely operating multi-vendor particle counters. EdgeMaker is process ready, a true solution. And today we will demonstrate to all of you how it works. Now, I would like to acknowledge that today our session is being recorded and will be available to all of you for playback in the next day or so. I also would like to outline the agenda that we will be following over the next 30 to 35 minutes. We have broken our story into three chapters. Chapter one, why is this important? And that'll be told by Fizzle CEO, Ben Davis. Chapter two, what problems do we solve? And that'll be told by Fizzle CRO, Jeff Christie. And chapter three, how do we solve this? And that'll be told by Fizzle Chief Product Officer and Head of Engineering, VG Surya Devera, and from the lab, Chief Technical Officer, Ryan Brady. Now, there are a few ways that you can engage with us during this event. Um, you probably have already seen the poll question, and so feel free to answer it, and we will show those results a little bit later on. Also, the chat room is open and will be monitored by Parker Wims. Now, there are two ways that you can ask questions if you have some. Fizzle board member Ron Ricci will be monitoring the questions from the Q&A tab, or you can email him directly at ron at fizzle.com. So without further ado, I will hand it off to our CEO, Ben Davis. Thanks, Cecily. I couldn't be more proud to announce our digital air series and the market ready availability of our edge maker stack. Our engineers have been hard at work for the past couple of years and have done the impossible. So much so, there are some who still don't believe we can do what we claim. But that's part of the reason why we're here today. You will see a firsthand live product demonstration and overview from key Fizzle personnel. But first, I'd like to set the stage for what's coming. The bulk of industrial IoT adoption has been mostly focused around power and machine health. The first major applications enable the transmission and generation of power. This has proven to be an incredibly valuable technology as billions of dollars have been saved. Just as an FYI, the first device to be connected to the internet was a toaster in 1990. But today we're gonna to talk about so much more than just basic connectivity. The next stage and possibly the biggest leap at the time was the introduction of predictive and preventative maintenance. When it comes to manufacturing, the preservation of machine health is the holy grail. The products that you are using right now as we speak were most likely produced by CNC machines, milling machines, lathes, and all kinds of manufacturing equipment that cuts metal, wood, and all types of other materials. The fact that manufacturers can turn off a machine before a part breaks and potentially destroys the whole machine has also saved billions, if not trillions of dollars and produced extremely efficient supply chains globally. On the other hand, pharmaceutical, food and semiconductor manufacturers, along with hospitals and others, rely on air quality particle counters to measure the particulate in the air to ensure the quality of the products they are building. The data that these machines produce ultimately becomes part of their intellectual property. This is especially important when it comes to achieving FDA compliance. The data that we are referring to in this case is scientific data. Scientific data is the next frontier of the internet. 
because it represents the automated operation of machines that are essential to an organization's core competency. The efficacy of drugs or vaccines, the safety of the food or beverages we consume, the cleanliness of hospital rooms where surgeries are performed, all rely on particle counters. Scientific data measures effects on human health. This is more complicated, it's regulated, and overly scrutinized compared to the data that is used to maintain machine health. Coke's secret formula, Tylenol, the COVID vaccine, all rely on scientific data to differentiate themselves from their competitors. Scientific data is also differentiated by the government or industry regulatory organizations that ensure protocol to follow compliance. There are many different types, there are two, many different manufacturers of particle counters, and the firmware that operates each machine is very different. Some particle counters do time-based sampling, while others are volume-based. The communication protocols are different. Some have web-based user interface, while some have to be operated physically at the machine. And this list goes on and on. It's important to note that this fragmentation requires multiple skilled lab technicians to operate each machine, thus creating an incredibly labor-intensive process. Our platform provides a homogeneous environment that enables the consistent remote operation of each machine. Fewer humans to operate each machine means faster throughput, fewer mistakes, a decrease in compliance violations, and ultimately a huge cost savings. Particle counters are not the only machines that produce scientific data. pH meters, osmometers, chemical analyzers are all machines that produce data that is critical to the formulation of products that we rely on to live healthy lives. I think it's safe to say that COVID has changed our lives forever. The promise of nanotechnology and the ability to deliver machine medicine directly into our cells will turn the healthcare industry upside down. Never has the quality of the air we breathe been such a focus. It's our opinion here at Fizzle that there couldn't be a better time to liberate scientific data and conquer the next step in the evolution of the internet. It is our EdgeMaker stack, a complete end-to-end -end system that makes this possible. We know we can't be everything to everybody, so the solution is comprised of three independent and interdependent components, the platform, our connector agents, and our patent pending edge decision engine. Well, listen, that's enough for me. I hope that I've done a decent job in setting the stage uh, for what you're going to hear. I'd now like to turn it over to our chief revenue officer, Jeff Christie. Jeff, hey, I got it. I had to meet myself. Hey, thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. You did a great job of outlining it. And uh, now the exciting, really energizing part of the presentation is take a look at that picture. That's a particle count. And that's a particle counter that our customers use multiple times a day, hundreds of them per manufacturing facility. And uh, they generate a lot of great scientific data. One of my best opportunities is I get to listen to them on a regular basis. And I've learned a lot. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you what they're telling us about their operation, what they're telling us in terms of what their environment looks like and what they are telling us the benefits are before I turn it over for the demo. So before we dig in, but to understand how we're revolutionizing the way that these things are operated, remotely operating them, let's talk about how our customers are doing it today. One thing you'll notice about this machine is it's not connected to a network today. Most of them aren't. And even though there are good power and good preventative maintenance uh, applications for it, our customers are telling us the value just hasn't been worth the effort to bring them onto the network because it's a difficult thing to do in a multi-vendor mature fleet environment. And so it wasn't worth the effort until Fizzle solved the scientific data stack. Today, a lab technician takes this machine around on a cart all over the manufacturing floor, dozens of them in every production facility, 
and they do manual tests. They walk up to the, to the uh, display screen here, they punch some buttons, they dump the buffers, and then they initiate the test. They then print the results of that test off on this paper that you see, which looks like a POS register tape, thermal paper. They put it into a folder. They put it back on their cart. They go to their next position and they do it all again. And these lab technicians are expensive. And the fact that they're actually then giving that data to a clerk to manually enter into the lab, the lab information system demonstrates that there can be user errors associated with it. Not to mention, if they get a bad test, it can often take hours to discover that in the, in the manufacturing floor because they're the only ones that has that result. In our customers, what they tell us all the time and in our, our largest uh, pharma manufacturer, they have five different manufacturers, probably 15 different devices, and many of the machines are 12, 13 years old. To have a software system that can bring all of those on board onto one system, operate them all remotely, normalize the data so that it's appearing to them in the way that they want to see it as opposed to disparately, has been quite a feat that is saving them millions of dollars in labor costs and eliminating a lot of the errors associated with manual data reporting errors. So to show you how this happens, uh, Ryan Brady, our chief technology officer, and VG Surya Devara, our chief innovation officer and lead engineer, are going to walk you through how they figured out how to do this. Guys, gals. All right. So um, I'm going to share uh, from our lab here um, in Colorado. So here, I'm actually going to just share very briefly, and then and then unshare just to kind of release the screen. So so just to kind of give you an idea of of where we're at. So so this is our lab in Colorado. So um, really excited to be able to show you what we're working on. Culmination of a lot of work. So this is, this is very exciting for us. Um, so, so what we have here is in our, in our lab, um, we have these two devices on the bench here. So we have a particle counter. This is very similar to the ones you've, ones you've seen. I'll do a close up here. So this is a, a particle camera, counter, the Climet. And so this is a great little device. It's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than a toaster. So, um, but this is a, a paired with an 829. This is a, a Cisco industrial router. And so um, this will actually run, not only do we handle all the communication, but it also runs our edge software on it. And the way we connect these two is um, you know, pretty apparent. We've got an ethernet cable that goes in between the two. So the climate is designed to, to do some network communication. The thing is, it's not designed to be solely operated through, through ethernet and do everything that needs to be done through ethernet. So that's a big, problem and all those gaps can be filled but with the software that's that's running on on the uh, edge gateway here and i think that it's it this is true across different devices so this is the climate we've got over here we've got the met one we've got a lace air down there it, i mean we've, we can connect different devices to the same a29 and it'll make them all operate the same so that's that's very very key and very very important to a lot of our our, our customers so um, and, and that's not a trivial task because not only do, like if you take a climate from different eras, they behave differently. If you even put a different firmware on this climate, it'll behave differently. And closing all those gaps in a highly regulated industry is really tough. I mean, some of these devices, it takes two different protocols just to get the data out of the thing. And then there's other devices where it'll produce a date without, without, without a timestamp. I mean, you know, in terms of like a, like a um, a time zone so you have no you have no idea wh which time zone this is in and like regulators need to know which time zone you're talking about so so this this setup allows us to fill in those gaps but let's uh let's let's go in a little uh deeper and actually show the the, the ui so i'm going to go back to my screen that i showed before and so um this is our web ui that we have um for our our our, our platform so you can see i've got a few different devices here um, you, you're seeing the uh, the, the climate, um, you know, on on the uh, on the bench here. But these other three are behind me. They're all in the room with me, but they're uh, uh, they don't necessarily have to be. Now I'm just going to deactivate one of these just for a moment so we can onboard it. So you know, when we have a device that has been um, when it, that it's actually been um, discovered, and again, you just plug in the software, a couple of very minimal configurations, and then you can onboard a device. It's automatically discovered. The way we discover it is, you know, we just give it a name, demo, 
lace air and a device ID of one, we can onboard the device and that's it. So really, I mean, doing the um, onboarding process is very simple. All you're really doing is just tagging the device and saying, I, I know where this came from and this is what it's called and it's ready to be used. And so if we want to take a measurement, because that's what we're all here to do, right? So, um, you know, I start a measurement. I, I'm going to do, you can see we've got some other devices in here, but today we're focusing on particle counters. So I'm going to start start a sample. So, I, you know, I'm going to make this a little longer, like maybe just 15 seconds. And then I'm going to select a device. And again, see, this is key. Here, I've done my settings. I haven't even selected which device we're going to use yet, because it doesn't matter. You can use a, a device from any manufacturer. So um, I'm going to choose the Clement just because it's on the bench so we can see it. And uh, in a highly regulated industry, e-signatures are extremely important. So you can see that it's about to go. I'm going to just unshare my screen here. If I can find my stop share button. And then I'm going to do a quick zoom in here so you can actually see this start up. So you can see it just started. And I don't know if I kind of lean forward if you can kind of hear it go. But um, it's actually taking a sample. You can kind of see the, some, the numbers populating on the screen. And it uh, completed that sample. So now if I kick back to our web UI, um, and so this is, this is completed and go to our measure area and see that this is the actual uh, measurement we just, we just took. And the, there's all this metadata that's available. And so normally this would be printed out on paper. Like this, a lot of this data would be on just a, like a literal like thermal paper. And that's one of the most absurd things about all of this is that, I mean, this is, it's great to be able to collect all this data and do it so quickly and simply, but, um, but the getting away from the paper is something that when, when I was introduced to this industry, I think I really underestimated how important that is. So um, if, I, if I actually come back to uh, my um, overhead shot here and you look, there is actually a just a panel in the back here. This is where the paper goes, right? So there's there normally a roll of paper. This is the same thermal paper that you would see at a grocery store. So it like has to be photocopied because it doesn't it doesn't last, which is is just crazy. So not only so you have these really 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 essential um, you know uh, documents actually being like photocopied in 2021. So uh, and I have a little bit of a story of why this is out of paper. Um, now, when I did that demo just a moment ago, I just ran it right here. Everything's within like 10 feet of me. But we actually provide access to all of this to our team, which is globally dispersed. I mean, we've got folks in India, folks in China, East Coast, West Coast, and everybody shares the equipment that's in this room and it's not a big deal because it's all remotely accessible. Um, so, and that's one reason why we put some effort into all the video equipment because people need to be able to, you know, it is nice to be able to see what you're working on. But I'm gonna share my screen again. And then, uh, so the um, so the climate a while ago, I took it. Uh, this is about uh, almost a year ago, early COVID days. Everything shut down. Brought the you know to my home office. Brought some devices to my home office just for better access. Set up the device for remote access so that one somebody in our India team could use it. And I woke up the next morning to this. He had been running samples all night, and I had forgot to turn the printer off. And so it ran through an entire roll of paper. Um, so that's actually why this device is out of paper. Now, I, I threw it on my office floor just so you can get a better idea of how much paper this was. But he, my, the, uh, our, our developer in India had no idea that this paper was coming out of the machine because he was just operating remotely, getting all the data he needed. Um, and the absurdity that normally you would have this much paper to capture that data wasn't lost on my eight-year-old son. He came into my office and saw the pile of paper and just thought it was hilarious. He, you know, so he had a lot of fun with that. But, um, but anyway, I think that this is, uh, um, it's really important to know that, um, that it's, it's not trivial what we're doing here, getting, the, getting away from paper. It's not the most exciting thing to talk about, but when you start talking about AI and all those other things, this is where it starts. You got to get rid of the paper first. So, um, but, and it's also not just particle counters. So we have, um, you know, there's all these devices in here. I mean, we've got a, a UV photo spectrometer. We've got a pH. pH is a big one. Osmometers. I love the osmometer because I just love being able to interject milliosmol into a conversation. It makes me feel like a chemist. So, um, but 
you know, that there's the chemistry analyzers are amazing. So we're working on all these devices and we'll be releasing those soon, but, uh, uh, but it's an exciting time and, and it's, it's exciting to be able to take some of this, the, the tedium and precision out of this whole process. But to kind of dig in a little bit deeper, I kind of want to uh, uh, pass the time over to, uh, uh, to, to Viji. So. Thanks, Ryan. Um, that was awesome. I think seeing that picture of your son with all that paper shows really the complexity and absurdity of the problem, right? That um, I, I will kind of take off from what uh, Ryan was talking about and kind of walk you through um, what the current process is. Um, even Jeff has already talked about it a little bit, but I really want to walk you through the process of day in a life of an operator and how our software is really changing that. Um, so today, if you look at a pharma, typical pharma uh, customer, they are getting their schedules for the day saying, here are the list of uh, readings we have to do today. And the operators then get that list from a lab information management system. They print it out. They put it in a file, they take the uh, individual machines that has a little handle there, <laughs> they typically have a cart, and they go to these locations, which won't change unless you uh, buy individual um, particle counters and place them on those locations, because the cost benefit is so much that it is worth buying more particle counters and not having to walk around with these things. But that's something Jeff can even elaborate more. But uh, what they do today is they walk from location to location. They take that paper that they have, which says, here is where you have to do the reading. Here are the measurements we have to take. This has to be this volume within this time period and, and so on. So they go into the machine and physically press those buttons and say, I want to run a volume uh, one cubic feet. And then they do that and they get the printout that Ryan was showing. And they actually attach it to their file. They also make notes if there is anything happening around it, around uh, that location when they were making this uh, measurement, and then they go ahead and um, uh, do the uh, same thing again and again until the list of those uh, uh, scheduled runs are done. And once they're done, they go back to their desk, uh, take that file, which has all these printouts and all those lab sheets in the logbook or their file, depending upon the customer. And they then make photocopies of these things and put them into the file and then enter manually on this data back into the lab information management system. So now two things really stand out in all of this, right? One is this is something that has to be done every day and it's super important. Otherwise they wouldn't really be going through that tedious process. Two is there are so many steps in this that are uh, so human intensive, so labor intensive, it is possible that we, we will make mistakes, right? Even if one digit is off, you basically have to redo that whole reading and it won't work. And then after all of this, there is another step, which is the validation QA, um, you know, whatever they are called within each of this customer, where they come in and say, because it went through so many uh, steps, they have to make sure it was captured accurately. So then they go and look at all the data and again, confirm, look at the paper, look at the data entered in the system and say, it's all working. And that is why when we talk about, you know, 1.8 persons per device, you really don't need two people to carry the device. <laughs> the two people that is required is because you have to double check everything. Everything is manual and you can't make a mistake. So this is where all this additional labor comes in. And when we are coming in, what happens in our system? And I'll share my screen now so I can run the same, um, same uh, kind of sample that Ryan has run so you can see how this is working. And we really are talking about remote operation. I'm located in California, the device is in Colorado. So you can see the same screen. This is all on uh, the same UI that we just talked about. He just onboarded this demo laser and we'll go and start a measure. This is the measure that he created uh, just a couple of minutes ago. So I'm going to start another one of the same thing. And the way this will work is right now we are defining uh, that this is how, how we want to do the sample. But in reality, we pull this data from, from the lab information management system. You don't even need to enter this. So you have an option to run ad hoc samples, or you can get all this data out of this lab information management system where all the scheduled runs are already pulled in. You don't need to carry files anywhere anymore, right? So as a user, you just have your tablet and you have your particle counter 
and you're going to your location, you open your tablet, this will all be filled in because this data would have come from the lab information management system. You would just say, you would just choose which device you want to use. In this case, it will be uh, climate because that's the one we have on the demo table. And then you start sample, right? And uh, again, I'm entering, this is the e-verification piece to make sure that it's all good. While the sample is running, if you find that there's something wrong with, uh, with the location, maybe somebody walked in, you can abort it and say, I don't want to do that anymore. And I'm going to stop talking. Yeah, and here uh, um, you can kind of see right here that I actually have it. It actually is running right here. I didn't, I swear I didn't touch anything. So, you know, this is, uh, um, yeah. And this is one of the reasons why I don't leave paper in this because, you know, other people may use this device at any time of day, so. Yeah, exactly. So now when we come back here, you'll see the second sample is finished, right? This is about 10 minutes apart from where we did the other one. These times are all in UTC, so the timings will look a little different, but basically this is all the stuff that we ran right now. And as an operator, again, I finished the sample by just with one click. I started the sample with one click, and then I come here and look at the data, make sure that this data is within the parameters that we like, and you confirm the result. Again, you have to do a, a e-signature to review and verify it. And once you do this, at this point, it actually goes and syncs this data to the system like a lab information management system or an MES system or other systems, right? Uh, so it has become so simple. The user does not need to go click on any of those uh, buttons. They don't need to enter any data. They don't need to take printouts. They don't need to do photocopies. They don't need three people looking at it. Uh, it, at the physical stuff. There will still be validation, but it'll all happen through the UI. Uh, it's a very simple process. Now, the, the simplicity of this UI belies the amount of work that went in in the back end. In collaboration with our partners, the amount of time we put in, in making sure these devices perform the way they are expected to perform is incredible. You know, it's a very well known thing in software that you may build something for three months and then you will need equal amount of time to test it. But in our case, we took almost two times as much time to test all the different scenarios that can happen. When we start a sample from our system, if somebody goes personally goes and touches the uh, device, what happens, right? Um, so we've really taken care to make sure there is consistency, reliability, and the data uh, standard that we expect. So when you go through uh, an FDA approval or a GMP certification, it is going to be very easy because this is something we did in a live environment where we knew that these are the kinds of issues that the customers are facing. Um, just, to, just for fun, I'll show you one more thing. I'm going to start a measure on one of the other uh, particle counters that we have. Uh, again, there are a lot of other things you can do. You can do a flush, you can do a continuous run, you can uh, schedule samples. Um, but in this case, I'm just going to run something on um, one of the other devices so you can see how that looks like. So we'll take the laser, for example, and I'm going to start the sample. And this is how we did all our development. So when people say we can't do this remotely, we want to show you <laughs> that this is in reality what's happening. You can see it counting down here and now it will start running. We have these cameras on these devices in the lab. So we run the samples. When it's done, we pull the data back into our system and we look at it because, you know, uh, today for the demo purposes, Ryan has taken that particle counter onto his desk, but in uh, normal circumstances, it's sitting in those very controlled environments where we can make sure that we are running the samples as expected. And again, you will see the sample is finished on the demo laser and it's ready for us. So we are really happy to have all of you here. Uh, we are excited to show this demo and talk about you know, the complexity of the solution. But I, uh, I think this gives you an overview of what is possible uh, when we have a solution like this. Hey, hey VG, thank you for that. I want to put a quick point on that because one global five pharma company told us that by doing what Ryan and VG have just described, we are saving them $75,000 to $100,000 in OPEX per year per particle counter. And they have over 1,000 particle counters. That's a significant ROI. 
it's a significant project. Thanks for all the hard work on this, VG and Ryan. Great job on the demo. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And I think, you know, this is something uh, that we're very proud of. It took a lot of work to make this work. Uh, just to kind of outline one more time, we have so many different devices that behave differently. They have different protocols. They have different kinds of data formats. Sometimes we have to use multiple protocols to get the data we need. Like Ryan said, some of them don't even tell us time zone. So we had to, you know, figure out a way to get it from a different protocol and combine the data together. But all that is invisible to you. It is all tested and it is all all accurate and you can be uh, guaranteed that this is all accurate data that you're getting and that is what we're really proud of the fact that we've standardized the data and we've standardized the operations of these various particle counters and we can make sure that the data you get from it is reliable thank Thanks you EG. <laughs> thank you ben thank you ryan thank you jeff you all have done an incredible job of uh, telling our why, our what, and our how. So we've had some questions come in, but before we jump into that, Ron, do you have results of the poll? I think I'm, uh, I think if you, uh, yes, Seth, um, I want to uh, congratulate the audience on knowing more about particle counters than most of us have. Uh, 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 the answer, of course, is all of the above and uh, appreciate the uh, uh, inputs, the answers uh, for this. Our main point on this question was to educate people about uh, particle counters um, as uh, it is uh, potentially a new way to think about how automation can uh, really impact the world, Seth. So uh, thank you everybody for that. We did receive some questions and I'm gonna run through them pretty fast so that we can get through them as quickly as possible. Uh, let me just ask uh, first to Ryan and VG, was that the first time ever in the history of particle counters that two particle counters were managed remotely through a cloud-based interface? I, I, I will say, as far as I know, yes. <laughs> yeah, just, that question was important to get that answer to because it really yeah. does get to the point that we're doing something for the first time. Um, here's a number, I have a number of technical questions, VG and Ryan, if you could maybe give us a little bit of your perspective on. Uh, one question is, is really just understand where the software stack sits. You know, there is the particle counter itself, there's the Cisco router, and then there's our stack. Could you maybe let the audience know sort of where our stack sits uh, uh, between those devices and how they interact with each other? Um, sure, Jeff. I, uh, sorry, Ron. Uh, I can take that initially, and Ryan, you can add more uh, as you need to. So we have, um, as initially when Ben was showing this, he talked about uh, different layers in the solution. And one is the edge layer, which is the software that is actually talking to the devices and uh, the data management and edge management piece, the edge maker piece, that's all sitting on the router. That's on the Cisco router that um, Ryan was showing. Um, that is the piece that is basically taking care of all the data in the context and how edge makes a difference in this, you know, if I can take 30 seconds. Uh, why this edge piece is important is because instead of just pushing all the data forward uh, to the platform, which a lot of systems do, where you don't even know what this data is about. Right, because each of these devices behave differently. They don't really uh, give you data that's complete. So because we are on the edge, we are able to understand the context within which this got generated and combine various pieces of data in context at the edge and then send clean data back to the upstream. Now the upstream piece is all a platform. It can be on-prem. Um, in an, It's all running in Kubernetes and Docker. It can be on VMs or, or on servers, whatever you want or it could be on the cloud. Most of our, our larger customers, of course, prefer on-prem solutions. Um, the data that we capture, um, uh, where does that data, is, where is that data stored? Um, so again, the way, where it's yeah. stored is we have, uh, um, of course we have a very modern IoT way of, of actually passing data from, um, through our system. We have kind of a data bus architecture, but it all ends up in a database and it ends up in a database that's in, in Kubernetes. It's, it's tightly coupled with our solution. Uh, it's all very secure. And so we get some uh, natural security um, in there. And then it's also high availability. So, you know, we leverage a lot of the things that Kubernetes does well in terms of having, you know, uh, ensuring high availability and, and, and reallocating resources if a node goes down. And so that, that kind of resiliency and security kind of is, 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 uh, is really important to the customers we've talked to when it comes to storing their data. 
It also um, does get uh, pushed into their limb system. And exactly. Course, you know, I was yeah, just yeah, going yeah, to ask that, that part. That's yeah. <laughs> so right. that's, yeah. that's the real, that's the most important part, of course. You build on that, BG, about how, why that's important to be integrated into the limb system. Because one of the other questions that we got asked is, what other downstream integrations did we have to think about? And, and I assume that goes beyond just the sort of technical downstream integrations, maybe even some of the regulatory FDA considerations. Yeah, so um, currently uh, what we have done is we have some custom integration to limb system. We are working on other systems like MES where you have, um, it is meant for that particular integration, for that particular solution. On the other hand, we also have an open API to our system, just like any other product. So any customer solution, say an analytic solution or a service management solution uh, can plug in and pull data from us as long as it's authenticated and authorized to, to do so. Uh, we also have notifications available within our system. So we can send notifications out uh, saying that, hey, this particular device is not working because even though we are talking about scientific data, we still have that layer of monitoring and all that also built in into the system. So we can send out tickets saying that, hey, there's a laser malfunction on this device. You may want to replace it or uh, do something about it. It's all very configurable. So depending upon the customer, uh, the solution can be managed any way that's required. Um, and another question has to do with obviously the security uh, aspects of this. Um, could you sort of describe for the audience the way with which we integrate with the security ecosystem and obviously within a regulated environment, what kind of extra work does that involve? Ryan, if you want to take it first, then I can add more to that. Um, I mean, yeah, it's a heavily regulated environment. So, I mean, there's a lot of, um, of, of requirements in terms of, I mean, how everything is done. So like VG was mentioning earlier that, I mean, we spent more time, a lot more time testing in this project than you normally would. Um, every step of the way is highly scrutinized. So in terms of how you're collecting the data, what data you're, uh, you're not collecting. And, and that's one of the things that has really pushed a lot of these initiatives forward is that the FDA is requiring a lot more in terms of, of, of regulatory requirements because they understand that a lot of people are still using paper and they're often just, ah, I'm not getting the results I want. I'm going to keep running it until I get what I want and I'll just throw away all the bad results. You know, and while that may be an acceptable procedure in some scenarios, it still needs to be documented and they still want that data. And so uh, the data integrity piece and, and, and a lot of these regulatory requirements around what the FDA was requiring, you know, they're, they're really demanding that these be digitized and that they meet these requirements. Yeah, just to add to that on, on the little bit more on the technology side of things, we have uh, encryption and TLS enabled through our pipeline to make sure that you know nobody can hack in, even if it's on-prem, it's not allowed. Um, also, we have uh, a way to recognize whether these uh, particular devices are supposed to be on the network or not. Even though we discover the devices, we don't enable them, we don't allow them to communicate two-way to our system. So it's a one-way communication. We only get the devices and then push them on. Uh, the other part, an important part of it is um, we are authenticating at an API level also, right? Not just saying once you connect to our system, you can get any data you want. That's not possible. Actually, every call you make, we are looking at, are you, uh, uh, are you enabled to access this particular piece of data or not? And so it's pretty well controlled and all, all over the place, including the pipelines, uh, the end on the edge side, and also on the integration side. One final thing I want to bring up is the audit part of things, right? Which is highly important too. So we don't allow the database access to outside entities. This is all controlled within the Kubernetes environment. And within that also, uh, we are isolating the audit and having like multiple entries for the same thing to make sure that, you know, it's not one table. If you change one table, the, the discrepancies will show up. First of all, getting to that table is, incredibly hard unless you know the passwords to everything. And even if you do that, there is like some backup things that we are doing to make sure the audits are secure. Um, we're getting probably more questions than we'll be able to answer in today's session, which is just another way of saying VG and Ryan and team, what you put uh, together is uh, getting a lot of people interested. Uh, let me just sort of maybe come back around and say, uh, for those of you who've asked questions, what we'll do is, uh, in our blogs, we'll answer all of them and, and release that over the next couple of days so that you can see uh, all of the uh, answers to your questions. Let me end, I guess, with a question back to Jeff and Ben. 
which is to really understand better for the audience the uh, go-to-market approach that uh, Fizz will be taking. The press release mentions a number of names like Intel, Cisco, Cleanetix. Maybe describe what their role is going to be and how you're going to go to market. And, and Jeff and Ben, if you could layer in one theme that's in the questions is, how is regulations and selling into regulatory environments going to affect our go-to-market? Is How does that all kind of work? Um, is it going to make us go slower or faster? Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start off, uh, Ron and Jeff. I'll let you um, kind of complete that, that, last, that last part of the question. So, Ron, we've been incredibly fortunate to um, partner with some of the best of breed um, companies in, in the world. Um, having the insight and the ability to develop a solution around a huge problem is uh, not given uh, to anyone lightly. And, um, you know, we're very uh, appreciative of this. And because of this, we've been able to formulate some additional partnerships and even have our uh, next committed customer. And um, we think that we will be able to leverage the knowledge um, as well as the um, experience of our partners um, in these regulated industries. You know, I'll jump in there and um, say that we're, we're going to leverage partner model for sure. And those are going to be partners like Cisco and Intel that have been in the traditional IT space doing extremely well, working with their IoT technology teams to go to market. But then also, um, you know, industry experts like Linetics, which is a one of the leading clean room manufacturers in the Northeast and uh, uh, really understands this industry very well. Companies like Glasshouse have been uh, a great uh, integrator and managed service company, but we're also gonna work on the operational technology side on the, on the shop floor. Regarding making it more complicated, um, Cisco and Intel have been great partners to actually help fund some pilots to accelerate the market for us, to prove out this in multiple multiple customer locations. And because of the complexity and the difference in all of our pharma manufacturing environments, if we can stand up a pilot to demonstrate what VG and Ryan just did in their environment, which is what we're doing, it will then require customization to their environment for it to be ready for production. And we'll have to enter into a scope of work to do all the customized work process flows so that we digitize what their flows are, not the way that some other customers done it because everyone's unique. Some people will want test reporting to remain with aborted tests. Some will want five or six digital signatures. Some will want dual authentication. We need to customize the, the, the solution to their workflows. And then once that's done, this platform is ready for them to just continue to scale and grow and operate and every device they throw on there will just start saving them money and the ROI will be immediate. So it lengthens a little bit of the time from conceptual sale to implementation, but that process is really important for it to operate appropriately. And Ron, it's important also to, to note that our technology is data agnostic, it's industry agnostic, and it's hardware agnostic. And we are 80% ready out of the box. As to uh, Jeff's commentary, obviously um, we have to configure uh, two specific uh, workflows and processes, but it is a platform that's really just about ready out of the box. Okay, well, thank you. Those were all some really great questions. Um, I wanna let everyone know that there are a few ways that you can stay in touch with us um, and learn about the EdgeMaker Digital Air Series. So all found on our website, you can walk through our self-service demo, you can sign up for the proof of value demo, and you can experience the pharmaceutical use case. And to do that, just simply visit fizzle.com. So we are at the end of our time. And on behalf of the entire Fizzle team, I just wanna thank you for joining us today. We do really hope that this session has added a lot of value and please follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks everybody.